Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us to uh, the second program in our Closer to a Cure community lecture series. Uh, this is a partnership between UCLA Health and the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. We'll be traveling to communities across Southern California to provide education and updates on the blood cancers uh, so that you can get the most up-to-date um, information on all of the new happenings in cancer research and therapies and feel confident about your uh, treatment decisions as well as for advocating for those that you love. Uh, so I just wanted to take this moment to thank the cancer support community of uh, Redondo Beach, particularly Nita Padilla. Um, I'm not quite sure where she is in the, in the audience, uh, but they've been really wonderful hosting us for this particular evening um, and really generous partners in this endeavor. Uh, so hopefully you have received the flyer with all of the events that are available in the series. Um, it is also published online. Um, so keep in mind, if we will be live streaming all of these and archiving each of the sessions on the UCLA website. So if the next prog uh, program is out of your range, you can always join us online. Um, so for those of you who are currently tuning in online, if you have any questions, go ahead and put your, type in your questions into the comment box and we'll be able to um, answer them. So first off, I wanted to go over a little bit about the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society so that you can learn about the different resources that we have available. Um, just to give you an overview, um, our mission is to cure leukemia, lymphoma, Hodgkin disease, and myeloma, and to improve uh, the, I can't read that for right now, <laughs> the quality of life of patients and their families. Uh, so we're the voice of blood cancer patients and uh, we provide uh, access to cures uh, for everybody who is affected by the disease. Uh, so we do this with, three with the three arms of our organization. It's research, public policy, and advocacy, as well as um, patient and family support and education. So I'm gonna be going over this a little bit more so that you learn about the information and education and navigation services that we have the financial assistance program, as well as the peer and community support that's available. So um, all of these are free resources that we have available, and you can access them through our information specialists. So these individuals are master's level oncology healthcare professionals um, who, uh, you know, they're in social work, health education, nurses, and they're really the epicenter of all that we do uh, for patient access. Um, so they provide one-on-one -on -one counsel and assistance for any of your questions about your disease and your treatment, your clinical trials, and they also help navigate all of the resources that we have available to you at the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. Society. So they can triage your needs. So there's a couple of ways that you can reach out to them online, by email. Um, you can also do referrals if you're a healthcare provider. Uh, but the best way is through the phone number. Just go ahead at 800-955-4572. And they're available Pacific time, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, these are the different publications for referrals, and we have some in the back if you're interested. So I think they're the most important point of contact for the Leukemia Lymphoma Society for our resources if you're interested. Um, from there, you can get free a ton of different free resources. We have some of the publications in the back of free booklets, or we can actually mail them to you, or you can have them downloaded so you can have electronic copies. Also, you can get connected to our Clinical Trial Support Center. Uh, so through here, we actually have a team of nurses who are completely dedicated to helping you sort through the clinical trials that are available across across the country. Um, and what's really great about this specific resource is that, you know, it doesn't just uh, sort clinicaltrials.gov and give you 50 different searches that you can use um, or that might be available to you. We can, we really speak to you. Uh, the nurses talk about what your needs are, how far you're willing to travel, um, and really look into your specific case to give you a unique search to really narrow it down to maybe three two to three ones that would be really helpful for you. And then you can then take that and bring it to your healthcare team 
to discuss it further. Uh, so they're really great. Um, I've seen a patient give her genetic makeup <laughs> to the Clinical Trial Support Center, and they were able to help find a clinical trial based on that, so it's pretty amazing. Uh, we also have Pearl Point Nutrition Referrals. So this service arm uh, provides nutrition services, and I think this is something that is really important to people. It's not just if you have acute needs uh, throughout your treatment. They can help you with meal planning. They can talk to you about balancing um, you know, your side effects based off of uh, what types of food that you're eating. So please reach out to them. And we also, they also, um, they work with people for all cancers, not just blood cancers. So I think that's a really great resource to have. In addition, we obviously have educational programs like the one that you're sitting in right now. Um, also, uh, there is telephone and web education programs that are available for both patients, families, as well as healthcare professionals if you're looking to get continuing education. Uh, like I mentioned, we do have all of the other programs available in the community lecture series. Uh, so the next one is gonna be May 15th on multiple myeloma and it's gonna be in Westlake Village. Next up, um, financial assistance. This is one of the pieces that is always asked uh, from, the from the information specialist is uh, what kind of financial assistance is available to me uh, for my family member. So we do have a couple of programs available. One is our copay assistance programs with can, which can help with your copayments or insurance premiums. And it can be anywhere between $2,500 and $11,000, depending on your specific disease. So we do have um, that available. Next, uh, what we do have unique to Southern California year round is the Susan Lang Pay It Forward Travel Assistance Program. So this is a $500 pre-programmed card that you can use for any lodging, parking, gas, which is really important to Southern California, um, hotels if you need to stay close to your treatment facility. Um, all of that is available for and you can get it actually twice in one year, so up to $1,000 a year. Um, so we have that. Uh, nationally, we also have our patient aid program, which is a $100 stipend that uh, is a one-time $100 stipend, and it can be used for anything, as long as you're diagnosed with a blood cancer. Uh, the next one is our urgent need program. So this is specifically available for those who are going through a pediatric and young adult diagnosis, so from zero <coughs> to, or well, from birth to 39 years old. And then um, after that, it's available for those who are going through clinical trials. Um, again, all of this is available through our information specialists, so you can reach out to them. Lastly, I wanted to talk about our peer and community support. Uh, so we have, a couple of different ways that we do this. Um, one is our Patty Robinson Kaufman First Connection Program. So if you're looking to speak to somebody more on a one-on-one -on -one basis, uh, we can connect you with somebody who has maybe the same <coughs> diagnosis, same treatment that you have, um, so that you can talk to somebody who has really been there. Um, this is a really great program for that, and they can speak to you one-on-one, -on -one, and this is more of a one or two-time call. But if you're looking for something that's more regular or speaking to somebody in person, we do have regular support groups. One of them is here at Redondo Beach, um, and the flyers are in the back, and each of them are facilitated by <coughs> a healthcare provider. Um, and it's, we have a couple of members here in the audience who are part of that group, so it's great to see <laughs> uh, some of these members here. Uh, we also have regular online chats that uh, are available on a weekly basis that are also facilitated by uh, one of our information specialists. Um, and like I said, we do a lot of partnerships with the cancer support community, which has a ton of different support groups and um, survivorship quality of life um, programs, uh, everything from yoga to Reiki. Uh, so please check out your cancer support communities as well to see what kind of resources they have available. Lastly, I wanted to talk about LS Community. Uh, so this is another way to get support online. It is a social media platform, and you can have discussions with other people, um, post questions, support other people in the same group, so you can see some of the different discussion groups that are available. 
Um, so those are all of the free services that we provide. But like I said, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, um, we fulfill our mission through the, the three arms. And the two other ones are research and public policy and advocacy. So we really do this through the fundraising and through the support of donors uh, to make sure that we have these free services and that we're really pushing the needle in terms of research. Um, so if that is something that you would like to do and you'd like to mobilize the mission, we have a lot of different kinds of campaigns that you can get involved with. Some of you are familiar with them, like Light the Night is a really community-oriented event that you can attend with your family and your loved ones or your coworkers. Um, and you can also fundraise while celebrating life and commemorating life. So it's a really wonderful community event to be a part of. If you have children or grandchildren, you can get, be a part, they can be a part of student series. And this is a philanthropy program in which the students fundraise at their schools and learn about how they can make a difference. So anything from that to climbing the mountain at Mount Kilimanjaro with team and training. Uh, we did have a patient who um, wanted to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And so when she was done with her treatment, she was actually at UCLA. Uh, she and her whole healthcare team fundraised and uh, climbed Mount Kilimanjaro together. So it was really wonderful <laughs> and inspiring. So these are the different campaigns we have available, but we're always looking for volunteers. Uh, I spoke to one gentleman who is a volunteer for one of our events. We're always looking for event support, administrative support in the, um, at the office. Uh, but if you want to give back to patients, you can help as a patient and family outreach volunteer or even as community outreach. Um, also, lastly, just to talk a little bit about advocacy, uh, if you share your story with our legislators and government, you can also help with uh, shaping some of those laws that are affecting our blood cancer patients. So um, that's just to wrap up the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Um, so those are all of the different pieces. And like I said, we're really proud about what we do um, as an organization. I think within the last two years, we have been a part of 34 of the 40 new cancer drugs that have been available and FDA approved, uh, which is amazing considering I think before in one year five was amazing. <laughs> so now that we can see 40, uh, we can really see the, move, the needle moving forward. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap my portion up. Um, so just a reminder for those who are online, if you have any questions throughout the program, go ahead and type them up into the comment section. Uh, but for right now, I just want to introduce our main speaker, who is Dr. Iridat from UCLA Health, and he's gonna be talking about advancements in the treatment of blood cancers. All right. All righty. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, so my name is, uh, first of all, thanks uh, to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, to the uh, cancer community, uh, cancer support network here in Redondo Beach for organizing this and for the, to the UCLA network to organizing this uh, and for the kind invitation. Um, I'm going to really try to cover the breadth of uh, all the new and treatments and therapies that are available in the world of leukemia and lymphoma. Um, just so that you have a little bit of background, really, I'm, uh, my area of expertise are really in leukemias and lymphomas and, and bone marrow transplant. That's what I do uh, uh, as an oncologist at uh, UCLA. Um, oops, we're going backwards here. Uh, oh, so we all ate dinner here, at least the audience here we ate dinner. So I, what the fellows always tell me, I'm very good at putting everybody to sleep, so I'll try to <laughs> keep you a little bit entertained. Uh, uh, things. Um, you know, nowadays we have... Um, we have uh, um, the country being run sometimes by Twitter, but uh, uh, oncology is also <laughs> is uh, is also evolving in that way. But I think uh, more in the world of oncology, actually, there's all new drug treatments that are available um, now. Just to uh, to cover everything here, there are probably somewhere around 
uh, over actually 40 different lymphomas. There are over 20 different kinds of leukemias. Uh, there is at least 10 different forms of myelodysplastic syndrome. So as you can see, collectively, what we call blood cancers, and that's excluding things like myeloma and and uh, you know some of the rarer uh, leukemias. So collectively, there are, all of these are very different diseases, and it's very hard to cover every single disease. So what I've done really here is to try to cover all of the the ways that we think about cancer and how we try to come up with newer treatments and get away from older style treatments here. Um, and just oops, I think um, just to cover, I'm going to take a literally five minutes just to get everybody in the same uh, wavelength in terms of what we talk about when we're talking about blood cancers. And then after that, we will talk about some of the uh, newer treatments. Uh, just a little background here. This is uh, kind of how we think about uh, the development of the, the blood and the, uh, from the bone marrow. The bone marrow is considered the factory for the entire immune system uh, and uh, all of our blood cells, all of our immune system are, is produced in the bone marrow. Uh, and it's literally in every bone of the body. There is a marrow element here. So aside from holding us up, the marrow, the bone actually provides the house for the factory for the blood cells. And these cells undergo a, 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 all kinds of maturation process and lead to all the different cells that you see in, a, in a, when you do a complete blood count when you go to the doctor. That those are all cells that are derived from the bone marrow. And by the same token, we have what we call lymphocytes, which are really primarily our immune cells. And those are all derived also from the bone marrow. Now, how do the blood cancers develop? Generally, blood cancers, these are really, as I mentioned, there are, it's not one disease. These are a collection of diseases. And fundamentally, what's happening there is these cells are growing uncontrollably. They're, they're just um, either in overdrive in terms of their growth process, or they're just not uh, eliminated. Or they're not uh, dying when they're no longer needed. Um, so that's the fundamental defect that happens in, in, uh, in blood cancers. Now, in general, why is this a problem? I think you can, this is a model, for example, I, uh, just to compare it, for example, with uh, another form of cancer, why blood cancers are a little different. You know, what happens with someone that is unfortunately has lung cancer, there is a, something that develops in the lung. This, this particular tumor then eventually finds its way to the blood or the lymph node. And, through the blood or the lymph node, it spreads into other parts of the body, which is what we refer to in that context as metastases. As you can imagine, this is not the case for leukemias and lymphomas because by definition, these are starting in the bone marrow and the blood. They are already ha are attuned to circulating in the blood and the lymph glands. So we don't apply the term metastases. And there isn't really in the same way as we do, for example, for um, uh, you know, some of the other malignancies like lung cancer and breast cancer, the same sort of a staging strategy, you say stage one, stage two, stage three. There are staging systems, but it's an entirely different process. One thing also to uh, that this kind of gives you an idea, if I can learn how to use this thing properly, um, <laughs> is that the treatment, this is not going to be something like in a blood disorder and so on. It's, there's no really, we're not going to be able to go and irradiate that spot because this is circulating in the blood. We're also not going to be able to do a surgery to remove the problematic uh, cancer because this is, not, you know, it's not uh, amenable to that kind of, and that's where we have to really depend on systemic treatments, things that are infused in the vein or you take orally that can go everywhere and fight the, uh, the cancer. So now, um, I think I already alluded to, uh, there is a really exquisite balance in the cells in terms of the cells growing very, uh, growing properly. And when they're not needed, they're, you know, they're supposed to be eliminated. This is a normal thing that happens in the bone marrow all the time. We produce red blood cells. They live for about three months. At some point, they're not needed. And there is a very exquisite mechanism to get rid of uh, those cells that you don't need them so you can make new ones that can function properly. If this balance is in some way disrupted, that's when we end up, so in other words, if you have too much growth or too little of these cells are being eliminated, that's when these blood cancers develop. Um, so balance is very, very key. How do we maintain this balance? It's in, it's in the genes and not these genes. It's actually in, your, in these genes, in, the, uh, in, the, in the, uh, the instructions in the chromosomes that really provide uh, the, the, the machinery in terms of, uh, sorry, the instructions to the to, the, to make the proteins that are necessary for the cells to function properly. Um, and um, uh, now, one of the things that always comes up is are cancers genetic disorders or blood cancers genetic disorders? Yes, they are related to uncontrolled uh, 
uh, to lack of control of the genes or the genes are not functioning properly, but the term genetic does, mo does not mean inherited. These are not the things that we are talking about in terms of what we inherited from our parents or we are going to pass on to our kids. We're talking about the genes inside the cancer cells that somehow have mutated or there's been chromosomal changes there that, um, that fundamentally disrupt that balance that I mentioned earlier. Okay. And the, the genes that I'm talking about are things that we refer to as oncogenes. And I don't want to overwhelm you with terminology here. One thing is, what do these genes make? They make all of the things inside the cell. So uh, this is a diagram of a cell, and I've just really very, very oversimplified it. But all of these signals within the cell, all of these receptors on top of the cell, everything is instruction. Th these are instructions that are uh, made by the, uh, that are um, delivered by the, uh, the genes. And obviously, you can imagine um, if there is any mutation, any one of these things uh, can become problematic and uh, lead to development of a blood cancer. Now, one thing to be cautious about is, uh, you know, there is only one disease that I know of where there is one gene abnormality that can lead to the development of disease, and that's chronic myel uh, myelogenous leukemia, or CML. With it, in that kind of a scenario, what's happening is a specific chromosome change. This is a, a normal uh, chromosome number 9. This is a normal chromosome number 22. What happens for some reason in some, uh, in some patients is that these things cross over, and what you get is a really new little tiny, so in other words here what you can see is a little piece of the ninth chromosome came over here, and it exchanged its spot, and that produces this new chromosome that we refer to as the Philadelphia chromosome. That Philadelphia chromosome is now putting the cell into overdrive and leads to the development of a disease. This is the only situation that I'm aware of. There's one specific gene change that leads to development of disease. That's not the case for all of the other lymphomas and leukemias and myeloma. In other words, there are multiple, multiple genes that uh, are disrupted, and that makes it a little bit more difficult to say, okay, I'm going to go after that one gene defect and therefore correct the whole problem, uh, just to be aware of it. So in all other cancers and all of the blood disorders, this is a multi-step process. Okay. How do we feel now? Okay. Um, Good health is a good thing. It's, uh, as doctors, we don't know quite often how to treat it very well. But <laughs> Now, um, I'm going to move rapidly a little bit through the terminology just to get the meat of the discussion here, which is what you're here for, is to hear about the newer, newer treatments. But I want everybody to know kind of what I mean when I'm talking about leukemia versus lymphoma versus all these other things. A leukemia is really for uh, uh, a cancer of the blood. We think that it starts in the bone marrow, and it, it's, as I said, these cells are designed to spread through the blood, and that's what they do. Uh, a lymphoma is really something that involves the lymph glands. That's predominantly. Now, there's a lot of overlap. So people can have lymphoma with involvement of the blood and the bone marrow, and vice versa. People can have a leukemia with involvement of the lymph glands and the liver and the spleen, and which are considered. So it's not an absolute thing that what each person, they, you know, the diseases don't read our textbooks. So we define them in a certain way, and they behave, but they behave in whatever way that they, uh, they do. Uh, Myeloma is really also a blood cancer that involves a branch of the defense system called plasma cells. And again, we think these things start in the bone marrow. And myelodysplastic syndrome, is a as the name implies, is a syndrome. It's not one disease. It start, it, at one end of the spectrum is just a condition where the bone marrow doesn't function properly. It just doesn't produce enough blood. That's one end of the spectrum. And the other end of the spectrum is really that it's, a, it's almost turning into a leukemia. It's becoming a cancerous process. Okay. So, and how do these things develop? This is how we think about the uh, development of the blood bone marrow, is we think that in the bone marrow there is a, what we call a stem cell. This stem cell, as I showed earlier, this lives in the bone marrow, it divides, and it also what we call matures into different kinds of cells. So it matures into this uh, branch that we call myeloid, and it, that further matures into all the blood cells, and it also it can also mature into the lymphoid <coughs> branch, and uh, as it matures more and more, uh, it becomes different parts of the defense system or the lymphoid system. Uh, and what happens in the case of a leukemia is at each stage, if the, the cells get stuck and they don't, they don't mature properly, that's when these diseases occur. So as an example, for example, a cell that started in the bone marrow, it's doing its job, and then uh, along the way, uh, uh, 
matures into this myeloid, what we call myeloid progenitor, but somehow here it gets stuck. Some mutation happens, some chromosome abnormality happens. We don't know why it happens, but it happens, and it gets stuck. It's almost like a teenager, a, a young child that is uh, maturing into a young uh, a teenager and a, a young adult, and eventually will becomes a functional person in society. But here we have a petulant child that is just not behaving properly. <laughs> obnoxiously and vindictively and in whatever way that you can. So that's kind of one way to think about these things. Um, okay, so uh, let me just go to the, and this is what they look like actually, if they were not so vindictive, they actually look kind of pretty sometimes, but they are nonetheless very obnoxious. Okay, and I think I already alluded to the fact that they are designed to go everywhere, and that's important to recognize. They, they circulate through uh, the bone marrow, they go through the blood, the lymph channels, they go to the liver and the spleen, which are, for the purposes of the immune system, defined as part of the defense system. Okay. Now, um, so, oops. <laughs> Uh, so the blood test thing here is part of the, uh, you know, the part of the, what we have to do, and bone marrow biopsies are unfortunately part of what we have to do in terms of uh, evaluating these disorders. Unfortunately, there's no way around those kinds of things. Now, this is the meat of the talk, which is what are the newer treatments that are available for the world of leukemias and lymphomas. One of the things that I already alluded to a lot about is this balance between cell, de cell uh, growth and cell death. Now. What have we found about leukemias in this regard? There is really actually uh, one thing that you can ask is, how, what is the cell death that you're talking about? There's actually a very intricate mechanism in all of the cells that we have in our body that allow the cell to essentially commit suicide when it's no longer needed. That's, that, um, that particular mechanism is what is referred to as programmed cell death. You hear about it about cell suicide, and you hear about it as, uh, this Greek word called apoptosis. So these are all referring to the same thing. There are a lot of actually genes within the cell that are actually devoted to uh, to allowing this to happen in a very, very organized fashion. One of the things that uh, happens actually is there is a gene called BCL2. This molecule here is, is uh, designed to stop this process. It's, it's, the cells have a lot of this to make sure that when you don't need to, when the cell does not need to commit suicide, this doesn't go through. What happens in some cancers, like follicular lymphoma, like CLL, there's just, for some reason, way too many of these BSCL2 molecules. We've learned this for the past 20 years. And what we have worked on for the past uh, decade is how can we eliminate this? How can we stop this break on cell death? And in fact, we have now uh, <laughs> done that. So this is kind of a, a diagrammatic way of kind of representing that, which is uh, if there's too much of that BCL2 molecule, the whole system shuts down. And so uh, the, uh, the cell doesn't go through suicide. But if I can somehow eliminate this break, the whole cell will undergo suicide and we can eliminate it. And about a, a decade ago, we studied a drug called Nevidoclax at uh, UCLA and that had a lot of side effects. But now, modern-wise, we have something called Venetoclax. Venetoclax was approved three or four years ago uh, and it is a pill. Uh, it's actually a, a very, very active pill and it, it does exactly what I just described. Uh, it originally was approved uh, as, a, as a pill alone for CLL, uh, and it's now, uh, its role has been expanded. So it's uh, now available in combination with Rituxan. I'll come back to Rituxan in a little bit, but those of you in the audience that are familiar with lymphomas, this is a, is a targeted treatment, a, a targeted immunotherapy for lymphomas. And so this combination or a, a different uh, drug called obinutuzumab, again, anti, another anti-CD20 molecule antibody, this is very, are all available to anyone and any oncologist can uh, provide uh, this care and this is probably one of the most effective treatments that is now available for uh, uh, lymphomas and uh, CLL. The same drug we actually studied it in the in the world of AML. Um, for those of you that are familiar with acute myeloid leukemia, this is a very aggressive uh, uh, leukemia that can become very problematic very quickly if it's not treated. The standard treatments typically involve chemotherapy and a bone marrow transplant, but there are people that are older and will not be able to tolerate chemotherapy and bone marrow transplant. So what do we do in that kind of a scenario? Here we are. We have, we have had medications called decytabine and azacitidine for years, for about a decade now. We actually did trials to see if we add venetoclax to them, are they, do they work much effectively? Indeed they do. And this past um, uh, year, this 
these particular combinations of the pill plus the chemotherapy are indeed available for are, are approved because data was so remarkably uh, uh, the data showed that the, the the combination is very remarkably effective for the treatment of uh, leukemias and lymphomas without having to resort to intensive chemotherapy and bone marrow transplant. We are also studying this in the context of myelodysplastic syndrome, the same kind of a strategy because myelodysplastic syndrome uh, can be related to acute myeloid leukemia and so we think that the, in the same way this combination may work and so there are a lot of clinical trials that are, that are available uh, in this regard. Now, what happens in oncology in general is that once we have a drug that works, uh, we make new versions of it. So that's the other set of trials that we are running in terms of uh, other versions of what we call uh, venetoclax, other versions of BCL2 inhibitors, either as, a, as an IV form or other pills that, that will eventually achieve the same goal, perhaps with lesser side effects. But that's been really one of the, the biggest hallmarks in, in these uh, three areas uh, in the world of uh, leukemias and lymphomas. Uh, to further expand this list, just to for the audience here, we are uh, also conducting trials with the same uh, uh, medication in follicular lymphoma because it, the, the previous uh, study that uh, we participated in at UCLA, and it was an international trial, showed that it actually works in follicular lymphoma as well. So, um, so the, the drug will have a greater role in terms of helping our patients uh, have, an, uh, have improvement uh, and um, without having to endure too much toxic side effects of chemotherapy. Uh, so that's the suicide that we're planning on for the, for the diseases here. That's the cell committing suicide. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, so this is, uh, you know, this is. What does it say? Uh, it says, uh, give it to me straight, Doc. How long do I have to uh, ignore your uh, advice? Uh, <laughs> uh, now, one, why did I put this here? Actually, it's, it's to uh, make a point here. I think that it always comes up when I talk about, uh, first of all, toxicity of treatments. One thing, you know, as I go through this, you, you know, we are... Um, moving away from traditional chemotherapy. Tra traditional chemotherapy is really um, considered um, really a controlled way of giving a poisonous substance. So that's really what chemotherapy is. This is not to say that it doesn't work. There are many people that have to get chemotherapy and it does work, but it comes with a lot of side effects. It's not particularly uh, targeted. Uh, the, all of the new treatments that I'm describing here are intended to be targeted. They're intended to go after the that the problem in the cancer rather than just poisoning the cells randomly kind of a thing. So that's hopefully this is uh, leading to uh, more effective treatments fundamentally and also uh, 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 much less side effects. But there are uh, side effects always uh, to any treatment. There is uh, all of these treatments, even the venetoclax that I just touted as a, a, a um, a really a major landmark in the field of leukemia and lymphomas has its own set of uh, side effects. Not like chemotherapy, but it's there, there. Now, why do I bring this up in context to this? Is really, it is fundamentally important that we all keep ourselves healthy in other ways. So people always ask me, what other nutritional things do I have to do? What other, or are there other things that I can take nutritionally or, or uh, other um, uh, supplements that I can take? Um, and generally, I would say, you know, honestly, it is extremely important to keep yourself healthy. All the organs have to be healthy. So I have, uh, uh, if I have a miracle drug like venetoclax, like even better drugs than that, your body has to be healthy enough, the kidneys, the liver, the heart, everything has to be healthy enough to be able to go through the treatment and benefit from it. So it's fundamentally important to exercise, take care of the heart, take care of the lungs, not smoke, you know, no, don't drink uh, excessively. Uh, so very, very important. Okay, now, a lot of the things that we've talked about so far and we always talk about in cancer is the problem, see, we always think that it's in, with the cancer cell alone. Like something is inside, I talked about the genes that go haywire and the cancer cell is just uh, growing in, uh, uncontrollably all, or it's not dying properly. But that's really not the whole story. What we have discovered is actually weirdly enough, and again, this is why I call them kind of vindictive, these, especially in the world of leukemias and lymphomas, we have discovered that the cancer cells can actually hijack the body and 
use the body to help itself. And this is what we refer to as the microenvironment here. So when we do a bone marrow biopsy, for example, this is, the, the, this is what we see under the microscope. All of these things here are the various different kinds of cells that we find in the bone marrow. In someone that, for example, has a blood cancer, what we find is actually not just the cancer cells, but we also sometimes find normal cells that are actually helping uh, the cancer cell. How is this happening? Weirdly enough, and, and so one example is in, the, in a disease called chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Let me just actually go to a better diagram here. This is the, the cancer cell. So we talked about all the different kinds of things that are happening inside the cancer cell that makes it a cancer cell. But weirdly enough, this cancer cell doesn't live alone in and of itself. It is actually receiving all kinds of signals from all kinds of normal cells. These, these are not cancer cells in the bone marrow, for example. These are actually our normal cells, our normal T cells, which are part of the defense system, what we call stromal cells and so on. So it's constantly communicating. Weirdly enough, the cell can actually change some of our own healthy cells to what we, what it, what we call now nurse-like cells. So this particular cell came from one of our own body's cells, something called uh, monocytes, and the CLL cell sends a signal, turns it into a nurse-like cell, and this nurse-like cell does exactly what, it's, what we named it for, is nurses the CLL cell. So it's basically this little bastard is <laughs> uh, hijacking the whole process and uh, using our own body to, to support it. Now, why is this very important? Because now, now that I know that this is doing it, I can actually, we can use any one of these, uh, these uh, signals and go after it. We know that the cell is dependent on it. And so it, uh, not only do I have to design drugs to, that go after the CLL cell there, we can actually have all kinds of drug against these pathways or these signals and be much more effective in eliminating this cancer cell. In other words, kind of depriving it of the nest, so to say. And in fact, um, one of the newer treatments that is available for CLL and for a lot of lymphomas like mantle cell lymphoma and so on is uh, the, the col our colleagues at UC San Diego actually discovered, a, uh, I can't see it from here, but discovered a, a receptor that is called ROR1 that is on the surface of these CLL cells, it's on the surface of mantle cell, it's on the surface of uh, a lot of other lymphomas, and, and it th does exactly this. It, commu it serves to communicate with with uh, surrounding cells, and we have an antibody, a ROR1 antibody, that can go after that and deprive the cell of that signal and therefore eliminate the cell. And so th that's what's coming down the pipeline in terms of treatment options available for patients. Uh, how do we know they exist? Because we can see them under the microscope, and in fact, under a better microscopy, this is the nurse-like cell, and this is actually what you see the CLL cells attached to it. This is not unique just to CLL. We see it also in acute myeloid leukemia. Uh, we haven't, uh, uh, the same process is happening is that the acute myeloid leukemia is constantly communicating with all the various other uh, normal cells within the bone marrow environment, and these normal cells are actually providing a nest. And so we can, if we know the signal, we can actually disrupt those signals and be much more effective in eliminating this AML cell. So uh, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, antibody therapies, including uh, I think uh, you guys are, may those people in the world of AML are familiar with something called FLT3. This is a, a molecule that is expressed on the surface of AML cells and makes it a little bit, when it's mutated, makes the AML cell a little more aggressive. Now we're developing antibodies to be able to uh, deprive the cell of that signal and potentially even deliver uh, immunotherapy in that fashion to be uh, better able to eliminate the leukemia cell without having to necessarily poison the cell via chemotherapy. So that's the, uh, the effect of the microenvironment. Now, one of the other things that has always puzzled us is if you, some look, you one of the things you could say, obviously, even based on what I just said, is why is it that the T cells don't do this on their own? They're sitting there. Why are they being hijacked? Why, why is it that they're not attacking and doing their job of eliminating these leukemia cells? And it's, again, this, this um, I don't know what... Uh, a slang to use after it, but this tumor cell has discovered a way to trick the T cell. So the, the T cell is supposed to, has a receptor, what we call the T cell receptor, and it's supposed to recognize this tumor cell and eliminate the tumor cell. But what the, the tumor cells have discovered, or have, have, um, uh, have done, is to express their own receptor that shuts down or uh, what we call tricks the T cell to not recognizing it. And that 
particular receptor is what is referred to as PD-1 and PD-L1. I think some, sometimes you hear this. Uh, and this is um, a mechanism by which, as I said, the T cell is supposed to attack the tumor cell and eliminate it, but because the, the uh, tumor cell has uh, this PD-1 receptor, it, uh, sorry, PD-L1, I don't want you guys to get too into the jargon here, but there is a receptor on the surface of the uh, uh, tumor cell that basically shuts down the T cell and does not allow it to do its job. Now, what do we have in the modern era of oncology is actually we have designed antibodies, which is what I've diagrammatically shown here, that can actually block this interaction. So now the T cell is not getting tricked. This is the man-made antibody here. It attaches itself to the PD-1. And the T cell, therefore, doesn't get this signal from the tumor cell and can do its job of attacking the tumor cell. Does this work? Yes, there are actually drugs. There are three drugs that are available on the market, and I think uh, so um, things like nivolumab and pembrolizumab have been around for about three or four years. Uh, initially, our colleagues at UCLA um, uh, studied these, this kind of immunotherapy in melanoma under Tony Ribas's laboratory, and this is now approved in that setting. Uh, the, our colleagues in again at UCLA uh, led the studies in lung cancer. So you hear, you see commercials for this uh, of Optivo and other similar. This is not a brand uh, discussion, by the way, but <laughs> it's it's available because this is now uh, approved for lung cancer. And in the world of lymphomas and leukemias, we have studied these. So all of these are, are now available for, for example. With pati uh, for patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, where their lymphoma doesn't respond to therapy, uh, uh, these things actually do uh, a miraculous job of exactly what I described, which is this is the tumor cell. For some reason, the T cells would, would be shut down and would not attack the tumor cell, but with the presence of these antibodies, they attack the tumor cell and eliminate it, and patients can actually have uh, remissions and very long remissions with these treatments. Um, so that's another category of uh, treatments that we have come up with. This is, by the way, is one category of what we refer to as immunotherapy that has become a hot uh, 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 title these days. Uh, um, and I will talk about some of the other older immunotherapies that have been around for a little while as well. Okay. Now, to the targeting, this is what happens when I play darts, is <laughs> nothing lands on me, which is maybe why I can be. Right, uh, which is why um, um, uh, some of us became oncologists. Uh, uh, but really, this is the reason I put this up. Is this is really kind of how chemotherapy works? We're throwing uh, darts and hoping that we hit the target, uh, but we're hoping to do a much better job. And and that's uh, uh, a lot of this has done through uh, what we call antibodies. And I think. Um, over the years I've given this talk, I've recognized actually people uh, have a hard time under, you know, conceptualizing what that looks like. So that, that's the purpose of the next few slides, is to demonstrate that exact <coughs> thing. So on the surface of these cells, there are all kinds of antennas, and I think I have even a better picture here. You can imagine this is the, surf the cell, and it has all kinds of different antennas, and, um, and there are all variety of different antennas. And, uh, every cell in the body has this. They have it because they depend on these antennas as a way to communicate with one another. But if we can find something that is unique to the cancer cell and, the, and is not on the normal cells, then we can use that as a target. And in fact, we have found it uh, on uh, 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 a lot of leukemias and lymphomas. And in fact, uh, probably in the world of leukemias and lymphomas, uh, people are familiar with a drug called rituxan. That's the first immunotherapy that came about, and that specifically goes against, uh, excuse me, after a specific antenna called CD20 and targets the cell in that way. So in other words, the cells that don't have CD20 are not eliminated uh, because they're not atta attached uh, by the antibody. So uh, this is a form of immunotherapy like rituxan, and there are many other new forms of it, obinutuzumab or alfotumumab, and this list can go on uh, for a long time. Now, one thing, how does uh, something like rituxan works? Actually, one analogy I would uh, give so that you, you know is really this, attaches, uh, this uh, antibody attaches itself to the lymphoma cell or to the leukemia cell, like in a, for example, in a patient with CLL or in a patient with diffuse large B cell lymphoma, it attaches itself to the cell, but that's all it does. Really, mo it's in and of itself, it's not a drug. It's not really going to, it can, but it doesn't really actually kill the cancer cells. All it does is it tags it. 
so that the immune system, our own, the rest of the branches of the de defense system can go in and eliminate the, uh, the, uh, the leukemia or lymphoma cell. This is the analogy I give to my patients is if you have a pothole in the middle of the street and the, you know, I put an orange cone there, the orange cone is not going to fix the pothole. What happens is, the, you know, is the, it's a marker for the city workers to recognize, ah, there is a problem here, we got to fix it. And that's exactly what something like rituximab does. And there are tons of uh, medications like this or, or this category, which is really are tagging the cell for the immune system. That's why we call it an immunotherapy, because in and of itself, it doesn't do much, but it can uh, activate, it can recruit the, the immune system to try to uh, eliminate uh, the, the cancer. So um, it, rather than us rebooting the whole system with chemotherapy, we can actually target the system, which is what the purpose of these uh, things is. Yeah. That's the old style of rebooting, which actually I still do. If the computer doesn't work, I just. Yeah. <laughs> um, OK. Now, now, how can we do a better job at these antibodies? So we've had rituxan for now nearly 20 years, and we have new versions of it. Now we can actually make uh, the same stuff in a little bit more sophisticated way. So what we have now is something called bispecific antibodies, where uh, it's the same uh, kind of a design. The antibody can attach to a unique antenna on the cancer cell. But the other end of it, we have designed it so that it can actually attach to a normal T cell. And what are we doing here? Here we are just bringing the T cell close to the tumor cell. So in other words, in one end, it's very targeted. Remember, it's very specific. So it attaches, let's say, to CD20 on a lymphoma or a leukemia cell. And the other end of it brings the branch of a defense system called T cells close to the cancer cell. And, there, and the, the T cell, it's almost like showing the way. Here it is. This is the problem. Can you please take care of it? And here, and the T cell can therefore, in close prom proximity to the leukemia cell, do its job of all the various toxins that are available and eliminate the, the uh, tumor cell. And in fact, this is a, a concept that works. The, there is a, a drug that is already available on the market. Um, I took a little bit of liberty because blinotumumab, so this is the drug that I'm talking about. This has been a miraculous drug in the world of acute uh, lymphoblastic leukemia. It's not exactly a bispecific antibody. It's actually a little bit of a smaller piece, but the concept is the same. What we are doing there is we have a, a very nasty leukemia like acute lymphoblastic leukemia and what we are doing is uh, by infusion of this antibody called blinotumumab it uh, attaches itself to the leukemia cell but the other end of it can recruit T cells and that can very effectively eliminate uh, the leukemia cells now this is not where the story ends. This, by the way, we have studied this in the world of lymphomas, and so blinotumab will become available also at, at, on clinical trials, and they're all ongoing in the world of lymphomas. But there are newer versions of this as well. So there's a drug called mosinotuzumab that is, does a similar thing. It attaches itself to CD20 in one end on the cancer cell, but it recruits T cells close to the le leukemia and lymphoma cell to eliminate the, uh, the leukemia cell. And these, there are tons of, this is not on the market yet, but there are a lot of trials throughout the world actually uh, with this drug. And this is not going to be the end of the story because this concept, now that we recognize that this idea can work, this concept is going to be expanded to all kinds of different uh, targets. Uh, but right now there's a, lot, a ton of trials uh, ongoing for uh, mosinotuzumab as well. Uh, and then one of the other ways is that, okay, we don't like to give chemo, uh, eyes and oncologists don't like to give chemotherapy because of its side effects. Uh, can I, but in some places it works though. So can I somehow deliver the chemotherapy only to the cancer cell and, uh, and not have it go to other normal cells so that we don't end up having too many side effects? And we have tried that as well. And there are a number of uh, drugs that have been developed and are in development. So one of them is something called brentuximab. There, it's targeting a molecule on the surface of the cancer cell called CD30. We're not very imaginative in, in the world of science in terms of naming these things, so we just call it. Uh, um, so th that's the target. And this is a specific target on the surface of some uh, lymphomas. And the drug itself is something called brentuximavidotin. Uh, and this is really an antibody that is bringing in a, a chemotherapy. It's, there's a chemotherapy attached to the antibody. So the antibody is very targeted. It's going to only go after cells that have CD30. So if the cells don't have CD30, they're not going to get the antibody. But once the antibody attaches itself, it gets into the cell. The, the chemotherapy part comes off and can actually eliminate the cell. So it's a way to just 
use the chemotherapy to target it against the, the lymphoma cell. And this has been around, again, almost for a decade. There's a new version of it coming out. This is targeting CD79. This is for uh, lymphomas that express CD79. It's a drug called uh, polutuzumab, and it, it's going through clinical trials, but so far the data that has been published uh, is, is extremely promising, and, and it'll be, uh, so th these trials are ongoing, so people can have access to them, and uh, uh, probably the drug will become available uh, pretty soon once the uh, trials are completed. Um, I can't even read my own jokes here. Well, Bob. It looks like oh, so you have a paper cut, but just we'll do a thousand blood tests here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> For those of your, uh, you who have gone to a hematologist, you, you notice that you can't get out of there without giving blood. It's not, no matter what, you have to. <laughs> Uh, okay, so now the other thing is the CAR T cell uh, uh, arena, which is again another form of immunotherapy. This is another way for us to say, can I get the T cells, which is a branch of our defense system, to do a better job of eliminating the leukemia or the lymphoma cells? Uh, uh, what's the what's the concept here? We have been trying to again, uh, as I've shown you uh, all along, is can we get the T cell close to the cancer cell? Can we activate it some way? Uh, can we kind of prevent it from being um, duped by the cancer cell? So those are all the things that we have talked about so far. Here we have said, can I engineer these T cells? Number one, to better recognize the cancer cell, but also at the same time to be much more active, become activated, and uh, do their job in terms of eliminating cancer cells. And that's exactly what uh, a CAR T cell is, uh, really fundamentally. These are all uh, our own T cells, so they're all our own branches of the defense system. We take them out by, engineer by genetic engineering. We can uh, design it so that specifically goes after what we wanted to go after, which in the case of, for example, lymphoma might be uh, a specific target on the lymphoma or a specific target on the leukemia cell. So we can design it in that way. We can also activate it so that when it goes in, it actually is ready to go. It's like an armed uh, 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 machinery and can do its job of eliminating. And does it work? Yes, indeed, it works. That's why it's now um, uh, commercially available. And there are tons of trials that are ongoing. Uh, I can tell you at UCLA alone, uh, uh, we have over 11 trials now active in just the world of lymphomas alone, just for with CAR T cells. So a lot of stuff are becoming. Now, what is happening in that kind of a scenario for a patient? is uh, the patient comes, we, they go through a procedure called leukophoresis. This is a procedure where the, uh, a machine basically takes out uh, these T cells out of the blood. Uh, during the, the process itself is kind of rather boring. Uh, actually, most patients just watch TV or fall asleep as the machine does its job of uh, removing uh, these cells out of the body. Uh, the machine looks a little bit, I don't know if somebody has seen a, like a dialysis machine. It looks like a dialysis machine with a lot of tubing to it. Uh, they attach it to the arm. It takes the blood out. It takes the cells that we need. The rest of the blood is immediately returned to the person. Uh, so those, cell, those are the, the T cells that we want. Those then get shipped and they go uh, uh, and get, become genetically engineered. That genetic engineering is introducing a specific receptor into the, uh, these T cells and then we grow them in culture. So we get a lot of these uh, re uh, available and then we bring them back to the patient and reinfuse them back into the patient. What happens now? So again, these are the patient's own T cells. So they go in, but they're again targeted against a specific um, uh, receptor on the cancer cell and, they, and they're activated T cells. So they go in uh, ready to fight and in fact they do their job and this uh, technology is now available for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and also for, P for children with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And all of the trials that are ongoing now is the intent is to expand it to all kinds of other leukemias and lymphomas. We're actually at UCLA expanding into even breast cancer and kidney cancer, but uh, in terms of the uh, uh, discussion here, um, the, there are, for all of uh, uh, the patients, there are trials available that give you access, to, because this is commercially only available for patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma, but if somebody has follicular lymphoma, mantle cell, uh, uh, acute myeloid leukemia, these are, uh, clinical trials of it. And the process is essentially the same. All we are doing there is changing the target depending on what disease we are treating. Um, 
so that's exactly what's if you wanted to see what's actually happening is again this is the the tumor cell and the t activated t cell uh, this is the receptor that we introduced it's you know th this is what we genetically engineer uh, by genetic engineering we put into the t cell and this particular receptor recognizes cd19 in the in the surface of the tumor cell and this t cell therefore can a eliminate the uh, the leukemia or lymphoma cell. And I, I think I alluded to this in terms of what is available now, uh, both in clinical trials and uh, in terms of uh, uh, conventional therapy. So, and you'll feel better when you see the doctor. This is what, <laughs> that's what I look like at the end of the day. <laughs> Okay, and the final portion of this talk, I'm ta going to talk about the, another way of attacking these cancer cells. And this is uh, uh, what's happening in terms of signaling inside the cell. So I think I showed you an earlier diagram of, as an example, let's take a, 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 a lymphoma cell. There are all kinds of these signaling. And the analogy I always give uh, to my patients when we're discussing this is, you can imagine one of the old TVs in the 1950s, 1960s, where there's a, a rabbit antenna wiring that receives the signal, the, the TV signal, and then there is wiring inside the, the TV that takes the signal from that antenna into the tube and you can the TV functions. Now, you can cut the wiring in the TV and the TV, you know, depends on which wire you cut. If you cut a minor uh, wire, maybe the volume won't work, but if you actually cut the right uh, wire, the, the whole TV will not work anymore. And this is exactly the same thing that is happening in, with uh, these signalings. So this is the same thing, for example, in a, in a CLL cell, as an example, which is there is an antenna on the top of the, the, CL, on the, top of the surface of the uh, cell, and there's all kinds of signals. Now, why is this there? Because the cell actually is dependent on these signals. It, it receives a signal uh, from all the other cells that have been hijacked. It tells it to grow. So it uses that signal to activate itself. And there's all these wiring inside the cell um, uh, that the carry the signal and tell the cell uh, to grow. So first of all, this is an extreme oversimplification. So you have to multiply this by thousands to see what, how many wirings there are inside the cell. But we have also discussed, and this simplification is really to, intended to say that there are specific things that are very, very important to the cell. The cell is dependent on that signal uh, for its survival. And if you cut that, the cell will be eliminated. And in fact, this is the arena which we, over the past uh, five, six years, we have made great strides. Um, sorry. So there is one signaling system that is called BTK signaling. And, and again, I don't want you to get uh, bogged down in the jargon here, but there is a medication, uh, Ibrutinib, that has become available for now five or six years. This is also another miracle in the world of uh, leukemias and lymphomas for CLL and for uh, all kinds of uh, lymphomas. And it does exactly that. It goes after a specific signal called the BTK signaling. It cuts that signal. And that particular signal is, again, as I said, very important uh, to the, uh, to the le leukemia or lymphoma cell, and the cell consequently dies. Uh, there are all kinds of newer versions of it, like acalabrutinib that is uh, going through its clinical trial, zanibrutinib that is also going through its clinical trial. Um, this has been really, again, miraculous for a lot of patients, and we are always not happy with the miracles. We want more miracles, so we are uh, designing better and better drugs with less side effects, and that's the purpose of having newer medications, is less side effects and, uh, and so on. Um, a different, you can uh, imagine that that's new, not the only signal. There are other signaling systems. So just as an example, I gave you a different signaling system. And there is a drug that, again, um, uh, is approved. is something called Idelalisip, or the brand name is Idelic. Uh, and uh, it works against this particular si signaling system. And there are newer versions of it, like uh, Duvalisip and Copanlisip, that are available on the market. And this list is also expanding. Why? Because we are designing newer new drugs that are more effective and less toxic in terms of their side effect profile. So that's the purpose. And again, I can't overemphasize that these are not the only signaling pathways. There are many other signaling pathways, but I didn't want to bore you guys with more and more jargon here, but just to give you a taste of how we think about uh, eliminating the cancer cells. This is also not just in the world of uh, lymphomas and lymphoid uh, leukemias like CLL. Uh, we are actually doing the same thing in the world of um, uh, acute myeloid leukemia. So we have discovered uh, some of the 
uh, pathways that a the AML cells uh, have an uh, alteration in the metal metabol metabolic pathways in the AML cells. So there are actually this uh, past two years there have been uh, uh, three drugs that have been approved um, that essentially do fundamentally the same thing for an AML cell uh, where they uh, uh, go in and uh, essentially disrupt metabolic pathways in the AML cell and eliminate the AML cell uh, in that context. So that's the end of my discussion in terms of uh, things. <coughs> All right. What questions can I... So uh, anyone in the audience can ask their question, just raise your hand, um, and then... Yeah, you know, I think if I had had you explain this before we did that, I would have had a little bit better understanding. If you remember, I came in all the time going, what? You know, <laughs> just that if you're... you're I appreciate it. So just to, may, let me repeat the question so that uh, uh, the people at home also know. Um, uh, uh, you, were, you were commenting on the, the, the kind of the, the uh, breadth of treatment options that are available. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the things I actually cautioned in the very beginning is this is not inten uh, intended to give you advice. So ultimately what you have to do is really uh, be aware of these mm -hmm. things being available and recognize this is not an exhaustive list. I just selected the most exciting parts of uh, um, the science to, to present to you guys. But ultimately, you have to sit down with your doctors and for each disease, for each leukemia, lymphoma, it requires its own therapy and you have to sit down with a doctor and go over what is the best option way in significantly the, the side effect profile. So that's a, really a fundamental thing. Thanks for the question. Please. If um, somebody's taking one of the oral medications, do they take that forever? Yes. Life. So, uh, just again, I'm going to repeat the question just for our audience at home, which is, uh, uh, oh, do patients have to take oral medications forever for life? So, uh, the answer is yes and no. Uh, so, let me just give you a little bit of a history. When, we, when things like Ibrutinib and Zydelic developed, these, uh, at that time, the only thing that really was available, for example, for patients with CLL or for patients with uh, diffuse large, uh, sorry, for some of the other lymphomas, I don't want to limit it to a specific disease, that was chemotherapy. And, some, and many of the patients didn't have many other options. So, in that kind of a scenario, when we started the pill therapies, um, we were ecstatic that they worked, literally ecstatic and, and jumping out of our skins that these things worked. And they, that's why I refer to them as miracles. And at that time, we were not designing trials because the, the, something like Ibrutinib is extremely well tolerated. Probably 90, 95% of people do very well. They may have some side effects. Don't, I don't want to say that these are all side effect free, but in comparison to chemotherapy, people are taking their pills. In comparison to chemotherapy where they had to come in, you know, uh, get transfusions and so on, suddenly the, all the things disappear. And so we, we, in the initial phases of trials, we said, okay, just take them. And considering these were people that really had no other options, even the idea of, oh God, I'm going to stop this just was not even a, something that we wanted to face. Now, we have become a little bit spoiled, maybe. Maybe also we are recognizing that we really don't want to necessarily be taking all these pills. So the, indeed, we are designing a lot of trials uh, to, be, to have a defined course of therapy. So that's why I said yes and no. Right now, for things like Ibrutinib and so on, we would say yes, if you're taking it and if it's working and it's not having side effects, you should take it forever. Uh, but what will come, and even for patients that are even currently on those medications, we will have data as to can you come off of it? How can you come off of it? What would happen? And, and a lot of the newer trials that we are running at, at UCLA, at, at all institutions, are really, again, as I said, are defined courses of therapy where you take the pill for a year or two years. It's already planned that that's what we're going to do so that there is an end to this treatment. You can not have to see your oncologist uh, every week or every mm -hmm. month even. You just have a life without having to be a professional patient. Uh, we uh, have oh. We have a question from online. Um, so what's the next drug if the Netoclex fails? So it depends on, so, um, depends on, actually, honestly, on the disease and on the, um, 
on what the person has had before. So we have um, a uh, for world of CLL, for the world of lymphomas, for the patients that have had, for example, venetoclax. If they haven't had ibrutinib, they can go back, go to ibrutinib. There is a newer class of uh, pills uh, that I alluded to called uh, PI3 kinase inhibitors. So there's duvelisib and copanlisib in that setting. And then we have Again, depends on the disease. There's ROR1 inhibitor. So the, the, the options are many, many, many options. Uh, I think generally the, the best answer to that question is this is something to be aware that there are many options, but not one particular recipe. It really depends on the person, depends on the particular leukemia or lymphoma talking about. And so you have to kind of discuss it. But we're not limited anymore, especially with clinical trials. Uh, you know, th there are tons of options available. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, are there any clinical trials now about homeopathic healing, like vitamin C intravenous injection, injection? Yeah. So I'm just going to repeat that for the audience at home. Is Are there trials for homeopathic therapies like vitamin C injections and, and, and so on? Again, the answer is uh, um, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, in terms of things like vitamin C infusion and so on, that has, uh, especially where I practice, which is the west side of LA, has become the new sexy thing. Uh, unfortunately, though, that this has been actually studied in the past as an anti-cancer therapy, and it never worked. So it certainly augments the immune system. We are aware of those effects. But as an anti-cancer therapy, it, it we already know that it doesn't work. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's the end of research. So there are, you know, uh, a decade ago, for example, in the world of CLL, there were trials on a green tea extract and and uh, uh, all kind and and I, you know, I um, in our at UCLA, for example, I see pomegranate extracts and so on for all kinds. Of, so so the research does continue, uh, but it's really based on really having some su some suggestion that this is going to work. It's the same process as any of the drugs that I talked about here is that we don't put patients through just because it came from a pomegranate. Somebody should do the testing in a cell, show me that it actually does something to a cancer cell. So in, in other words, in a laboratory, somebody should do that. Then somebody else should verify it. So I know it's not just you claiming it. Somebody else can actually verify it. Then maybe we can try it in, in people. They have the allure of being a little bit more safe because they are uh, coming from fruits and vegetables and so on, those kinds of or, you know, um, natural stuff. But again, like anything else, they're going to have their own side effects. When we originally ran, uh, not we, I should say the Mayo Clinic ran the green tea extract studies, even green tea extract at the doses that they have to give to uh, have any effect on uh, CLL, what was causing liver enzyme abnormalities and so on. So again, that's the value of doing it in a, in a proper clinical trial uh, 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 to, to know that answer that how effective is it and really what side effects is it going to have, what dose would be effective and so on. So the answer to your question is yes, we are running clinical trials and it's, you know, it's a, a big area of trial, but it's a, you know, uh, like any other drug therapy, it may seem very slow just because there's a whole process of ultimately at the end showing that, yes, this is going to work for a patient. Yes, please. Uh, could you comment on bentoclax versus ibrutinib? So the question is, can I comment on uh, venetoclax versus ibrutinib? But, uh, so, yes, I can gen make a gen general comment. Words, I've been on ibrutinib for a year, okay. If I were coming to you now, would you, as a CLL patient, yeah. what would you, what's the current thinking? Yeah. So, so again, for the audience at home, what, uh, what's the comment on uh, yeah. ibrutinib versus venetoclax in, in the world of CLL as an example? Uh, you know, if, uh, I can just broaden this to say, if someone is taking a, a treatment and they're tolerating it well, and they're not having side effects, uh, then we would continue with that treatment, knowing and being reassured that we actually uh, were one of uh, nine centers in the United States, that we did a trial where uh, everybody that had taken uh, ibrutinib and it stopped working or they were not tolerating the ibrutinib because it was having too much side effects. What if, you, if they, we stopped it, could they go on to venetoclax and would the venetoclax work? And the answer ended up being yes. This is all published now already. But so the, the, it's very reassuring to know that yes, there is another drug venetoclax that will work for sure 
if the ibrutinib stops working or if somebody cannot tolerate it, <coughs> would I tell you to stop the ibrutinib now and jump ship and go to something else? No. Why? Because they, again, it goes back to the data that we have. When, when you look at people that have been on ibrutinib as an example for five years, seven years, they are doing brilliantly well. I say this cautiously because there is a downside. You're taking a pill every day and you have to think about it and there's a financial cost and there may be some side effects. So it's not totally uh, an easy thing to do, but at least uh, in the big picture of things, it's keeping the disease under control and we know that it's safe for patients that are taking in five, seven years because that, those are the uh, people that are on the original trials that uh, um, uh, are ongoing and we are observing them. Uh, the only reason I would switch is really, again, as I mentioned, if it's not working or if it's having unacceptable side effects. But it's always very reassuring to know you have a backup. Are people now starting on Ventaclax first? Um, it depends. Again, so there's no recipe. This is something that you, so I'm sorry, let's uh, repeat it to the audience. Are people starting on Ventaclax first? Uh, um, it really depends on the person. So we are indeed running clinical trials to start with Vinilax first. Uh, and there are actually trials completed with uh, using venetoclax uh, uh, first, and those will be, you know, become available in actually after the American Society of Clinical Oncology meeting in June, uh, the data will become available. But I can tell you, yes, they work, and it's it's uh, an effective strategy. The question will ultimately at the end come up, which one should we start first? And that really uh, will become a discussion for each individual person, depending on what side effects they might have. Uh, each drug works in a different way. They have a different uh, set of side effects. Each drug has its own set of kind of uh, intricacies that you have to manage. So it really becomes a discussion for the person. I don't mean to be uh, in any way evasive or vague, but uh, it really becomes a, a, an individualized medicine. What works for you? always knowing that if you don't even start with drug number one, that's always available as a backup. And that's very reassuring. And, you know, um, I can tell you most of the time when patients come to my clinic and I, I talk to them, uh, one of the most anxiety-provoking things for me as an oncologist, and I've done this for now more than a decade, is if I don't have, in my mind, at least two or three backups. backups. That I'm always trying to see if somebody shows up and for some reason their disease is not responding to the treatment that they're on right now, it's very reassuring to say, okay, uh, in my mind, oh, don't worry about it. If this doesn't work, I can move you to this drug. And if that doesn't work, I can move to that drug. The, the time that I get nervous is when I realize, oh, we, we're, we don't, and it's rare because we have a lot of clinical trials that are available. So there's always something, but it's, I can't overemphasize how reassuring that is in terms of both quality of life and longevity to have backups available that will work just as well. It doesn't mean that you're being deprived if you don't go to the, the sexy drug of the day. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, please. Uh, you mentioned many of these drugs. Uh, what percentage of them are developed in universities such as UCLA? versus the drug companies? Uh, so uh, uh, for the folks at home uh, on the webcast, uh, um, uh, my friend here is asking what percentage of these drugs are developed in universities and uh, versus the drug companies. Uh, it's actually really a very largely collaborative kind of a thing. So, you know, at a place like UCLA, um, aside from the oncology division, there's an entire campus that is devoted to understanding the biology of all of these disorders. So it's not just us treating patients, but understanding what happens in a patient with, uh, you know, all of the, for example, the antibody work is from UCLA, from Sherry Morrison's laboratory, which is now over, you know, she's in her 80s. When I was an undergrad there, she used to work on this stuff. So why do I bring that up is basic science understanding happens at, at universities, not just UCLA, but really universities like, you know, academic centers that have um, basic science laboratories that can sit there and look at the nitty-gritty of all the various signaling pathways that I talked to you about or all the receptors, that comes all from uh, basic science labs. Then there is a very strong collaboration, of what we refer to in the world of oncology now as translational research, which is what I do most of the time, which is I 
on, on one end of the university, I talk to my colleagues and they're talking about this new pathway and these new um, uh, ways of hitting that pathway. And then we can combine that and say, okay, we can provide this in a context of a clinical trial and test it out and see uh, uh, does it work, is it effective as against the, the disease that we're talking about, against the cancer that we're talking about, and is it safe, and uh, what, what are the side effects? Of In regards to where the money comes from, it's actually for both. So the, most of the basic science research is <coughs> paid for by taxpayers, because that's what uh, the national science, uh, the, the NIH and so on fund laboratories. When it, when it goes to clinical trials in the United States, its majority of it there becomes uh, in the purview of the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies in collaboration with academic centers where, um, where they, they are trying to develop a drug, take it through these requirements of, again, the requirements are, I mean, just to oversimplify it is really the drug has to be safe, number one, it, we don't want new side effects or unacceptable side effects. And number two, it has to do exactly what it is that we or anybody else is claiming to do against the disease. Does it work for the disease? Uh, so they have to go through this pathway and the drug companies are the ones that really most of the time do that kind of a thing. Now, uh, there are s occasions where the drug companies develop these things internally. Uh, and there are also, at the same time, academic centers that develop uh, molecules and take it through clinical trials on their own. But if you take the, the whole body of uh, science in oncology, um, uh, it's really a collaborative effort and uh, different places provide different uh, resources. Okay. We have a question from online. Um, I'm interested in Hodgkin's lymphoma statistics for recurrences. How often, how many? Um, so. Hodgkin's lymphoma uh, is a, a um, is l in terms of re recurrences, they're overall relatively uncommon. Probably, it, it, to some extent, it's dependent on the stage of the person that has uh, uh, Hodgkin's uh, lymphoma. But probably, if you take everybody with Hodgkin's lymphoma, probably less than 10% of patients relapse with their disease or don't respond to treatment. So that's a small number of. Uh, of the original denominator. Uh, in the relapsed uh, circumstances, we have still a lot of options in terms of even getting to a cure. So in that kind of a setting, we talk about things like bone marrow transplant, which can again cure another 50% of those patients. Those patients that either can't get to uh, uh, a transplant or a transplant doesn't work. I alluded to the <coughs> immunotherapy, the checkpoint inhibitors that have become uh, my colleague John Timmerman at uh, was the UCLA investigator. This was an international trial. We showed that those <coughs> drugs work for Hodgkin's lymphoma in people that either had a transplant and the transplant failed or they could just did the disease wasn't responding to even get to a transplant, and, and these drugs work. So we have options, and we are expanding the immunotherapy. I mean, even um, just uh, if I wanted to give a talk, I can talk about an hour about all the different things that we have for immunotherapy arena. So um, there are uh, uh, a lot of options available, but number-wise, it's probably, I think I'm maybe even overestimating 10% of patients that may uh, relapse or may not respond. Uh, please. Uh, I met with you nine years ago for a uh, stem cell uh, transplant council, and that was when I uh, contracted uh, uh, brain tumors, diffused large B cell on Hodgkin's lymphoma. And you told me at the time, I forget exactly what it was, but the percentage of it uh, died because of this, going through this procedure. It was in 20 something percent. What is it now? Uh, so, so t for the audience at home, uh, the, as uh, my uh, colleague here is asking, in terms of the percentage of patients that die from transplant uh, when they go uh, through bone marrow transplant. So th it actually depends on the specific type of a bone marrow transplant. So uh, there is a specific type of bone marrow transplant called an autologous transplant where we use the person's own stem cells. The risk of dying there is actually less than 1% at a center like UCLA. On the other hand, if we're doing a transplant where we are using someone else's bone marrow, like a, a related, like a brother or a sister, the risk of uh, dying from a transplant is somewhere around 10% in that kind of a setting. If we're using someone that is 
not related to the person, or nowadays, you know, we can use, uh, at UCLA, we use half-match transplants. In other words, it doesn't have to be even a full-match donor, uh, what we call a haplo-identical uh, transplant, uh, or sometimes cord blood. Again, the risk goes slightly higher. The transplant arena has also significantly improved, mainly not that there are, dr are drugs and the chemotherapy has changed much. It's really essentially largely the same set of chemotherapies, but we've just gotten a lot better in terms of managing complications of transplant. So, uh, you know, 15 years ago, a lot of what we ran into after the transplant was people having infections and because their immune system was uh, suppressed. So now we have better antibiotics, better antifungals. So the, the whole field has evolved uh, largely because of the supportive care that uh, we provide. Um, so that's really, yeah. yeah. And then I, I elected to go with uh, chemo, methotrexate. Ah, uh, and you're doing well. Yeah, it, it beat it back. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, sure, I think she would. Uh. I just had a question, and the immunotherapy sounds like such a miracle, and it sounds less damaging to your organs, but I was in another talk where they said that, you know, there are, are a lot of side effects. So is it just a more targeted, um, targeted damage? So, so the, for, for the folks at home, uh, the question is really uh, with immunotherapies, there, there are, are there side effects and uh, is it just more targeted side effects? So um, a couple of things. Again, I go back to what I mentioned earlier that just because it's targeted, it does not mean it's side effect free. And just because it's not chemotherapy, it's not side effect free. So for immunotherapy, you can imagine what, uh, what I showed, for example, here is we are using the immunotherapy to really wake up the T cells, wake up the immune system to try to fight the leukemia and lymphoma. In that context, if, uh, if somebody has an just overwhelming active immune system because of the medications, it can actually cause autoimmune conditions and it can be pretty nasty. We manage a lot of people, uh, we manage, uh, you know, it's like any other uh, treatment strategy, we manage the side effects, but I don't think in we ever, any oncologist ever takes any of these things, whether we call it targeted, whether we call it novel, whether we call it traditional chemotherapy, they all have their own set of side effects. Now, the other thing that always factors in is when someone is considering any of these treatments, that's actually part of the, the equation. There may be multiple options available. There may be multiple uh, pills and immunotherapy and different forms of immunotherapy and even different combinations. And how does one decide which one to go with is really fundamentally which one is going to be uh, the most effective and the least toxic. Sometimes, if there are not a lot of options, we might have to take the risk of the toxicity, knowing all the full toxicity, and say, okay, we'll manage it. But if someone has many options, then you shouldn't really go to the most toxic just because it's immunotherapy. Maybe something better will work. But I don't mean in any way to imply that uh, any of the newer therapies are uh, side effect free. If you compare them to chemotherapy, they're generally much, much, much safer in my experience. But they can, they can have, you know, when we muck with the immune system, whether we, we make it inactive or we make it overactive or we're waking it up or, you know, we're still mucking with a system that, um, that can have its own consequences and, and we're all very much cognizant of that. So I think we're running low on time, is that correct? Um, so we have one more question here and one more question online, and then I think we'll have to yeah, wrap I, up. I just want to know which of the therapies uh, you believe will lead to a cure. I mean, what is because everything that I hear here is 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 managing the disease and making it chronic, essentially. Oh, thanks. So, so the question was, which of these therapies will lead to a cure? Actually. You know, um, and thank you so much for asking this question. I meant to say this actually in the beginning and I, I clearly forgot. The goal is actually a cure. The goal is not just simply management of the disease that you take the pill forever or you, and you just live with it or kind of a thing. Uh, so that is actually the goal. Which therapy, I don't, I alluded to this a little bit earlier in the sense that because cancer, leukemias, lymphomas, they're not gonna be one thing that is wrong and so therefore we fix that. That happens in the world of CML, because that's one gene that is leading to the problem. You can take a pill and that fixes the problem for a lot of people. It doesn't, it's not the case for most other leukemias and lymphomas. Most of the time what we have to do is to combine and 
for lack of a better description, attack the cell, attack the environment of the cell, attack the nest of the cell in different ways, and we will, we will get closer and closer to the cure. So the goal is not no different than it was before, which is the goal is a cure. Uh, what drugs, in all honesty, I can't pick, uh, because again, it's a, it's a wide field. I, you know, in the world of CLL, things like venetoclax and Imbruvica are actually getting us closer. So nowadays, the, the, uh, the combination of venetoclax plus uh, uh, Gaziva can actually get patients into almost undetectable disease burden, which is very, you know, that's the first step to getting to a cure. And the same thing is happening in the, in the world of Hodgkin's with the immunotherapies and, and so on. So what will happen over the next few years is really combining these, these treatments that I talked about plus newer treatments to um, really eliminate the disease and get to a cure where you don't have to take anything and you just say goodbye to your oncologist and move about your life. Yeah. All right, so last question. What is the highest and best treatment for mantle cell lymphoma? Uh, so that's a complicated question. It depends on the person, honestly. Again, I can't overemphasize all of these things. Really, you, you, one has to discuss with the oncologist. Uh, for younger patients, generally, we, so mantle cell lymphoma, just for the audience here, is a, is a lymphoma that can misbehave uh, in the sense that it responds to treatment pretty well in the beginning, but it has a tendency to come back over and over again. And each time it comes back, it's more resistant and a little bit more annoying that's an understatement of the, uh, the evening. It's a little bit more problematic. So what we do for patients with mantle cell lymphoma is we, we get them to a remission. And we, for younger patients, we say you should probably consider doing a bone marrow transplant in, in the beginning because that can actually put the disease in remission for a very long time. Unfortunately, it still may come back. But since that, it, that can keep the, uh, the lymphoma in remission for six, seven years, six, seven years in the world of oncology is, is an incredibly long time. Actually, not a single drug that I mentioned today was available six or seven years ago. So, uh, so it, it evolves very, very rapidly. And so six or seven years from now, I might have actually a pill that will cure the mantle cell lymphoma. For older people that uh, can't uh, tolerate, and it's, again, I, I just want to caution also, this, we use this term old and young, uh, not, it's not an age thing, I just want to emphasize, because uh, it's really more how the, how the body is doing. I alluded to this in terms of your, your, the body's health, in terms of organs. So if you're 50 years old and you have bad diabetes that is poor control, that's a problem. That, that, may, that may be categorized as someone that cannot tolerate a transplant, as an example. But back to the, uh, to the answer to that question is, for people that cannot tolerate a transplant, then we would say, treat the mantle cell and then go on to a maintenance. And there are a number of pills that are available or rituxan maintenance that can, again, achieve the same thing of keeping the thing under control for as long as possible goes back to what you were saying. We're, we're in that setting, we are controlling it for as long as possible until the cure becomes available. And potentially with things like CAR T cells and immunotherapy, that is actually on the horizon. It's not something that is a theoretical thing. It's really a, is something that is actually within our grasp. Okay. Right. I just, I, Sorry, I go. I just had one quick question. You mentioned earlier um, methotrexate, and I didn't catch in the context that you were mentioning. Can you uh, so the question was regarding methotrexate. I, th I don't think I mentioned it, actually. My friend here in the audience was oh, next to okay. it. And, yeah. Methotrexate is a, is a chemotherapy uh, medication, just okay. in case. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, we, let's give a round of applause yeah. for Dr. Yeah. Yeah.